Your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 4. Next week, we're going to be talking about a small group that responds to what we're studying today in Acts chapter 4. And I could echo everything that uh, Keith has said concerning uh, small groups and how important they are. Sometimes we really just take it for granted. Those of us who have had the pleasure of being in a small group and the intimacy of it all and how we have grown spiritually as a result of the interaction with people. <clears throat> it's, it's often been said that you can communicate uh, truth to a mind. Somebody can listen to you on a Sunday morning and, and you might learn something and maybe even the Spirit of God will apply it to your lives. And of course, that's the desire that we always have. But <clears throat> change of life really takes place in the small groups. And so uh, I want to encourage you as well. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that all of you are here in this uh, blustery winter day. I, I've decided I live a charmed life. Yesterday, we, uh, Linda and I were working in the parsonage trying to clean it up, get it ready for sale. And so we worked pretty hard and got home. And of course, I went up to relax a little bit. And, and Linda was out on the deck during the snowstorm cooking me a steak. Isn't that great? I thought you'd like to know that. <clears throat> For all of you ladies who want to try to emulate, no. <clears throat> and then this morning I got up, and as I usually do, I go into my study, or <laughs> it's not much of a study yet, but wherever I sit to study to do some last minute preparation, and then I realized, oh my goodness, it snowed last night, and it sleeted. And so I started to get dressed real quick and looked out the window, and Linda was outside scraping the windshields off and running the car to warm it up. And so, isn't that sweet? Just so you know. <laughs> Had to figure out how to pay her back some way. Well, listen, uh, we are... So a compliment rather than doing anything for you. <laughs> We are looking at um, a portion of Scripture that emphasizes the name of Jesus Christ. And I can't think of any better way to uh, begin this service is to remind you that um, it's the name of Jesus Christ that is prominent throughout the Bible. It occurs over 100 times, over 37 times, 37 times in the book of Acts alone. You remember that verse from 3 John where it says that the missionaries went out and they did what they did for the sake of the name? And here we're going to learn that there's uh, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. So the name figures prominently throughout the, uh, the Bible. And we want to always stress the fact that it's the name, the authority, the, the who he is that is most important for us when we live in this life. What is his name? It's Jesus emphasizing his humanity and the very name Jesus, uh, Yeshua, means, or Joshua means Savior. So he is the human one who came to die. He is Jesus the Savior. He is the Christos, or the Moshiach, uh, Christ. He is the divine Messiah who has come to his people Israel. He is the Messiah of Israel. He is the Savior of the world. And then he is also called the Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's not just a man, but he is God himself. He is the Lord incarnate. And so when we think about the name of Jesus Christ and we learn in this passage, well, back to the previous uh, incident when the man was healed there outside the beautiful gate by that beautiful name. And it says in verse 16 of chapter 3, it's on the basis of faith in his name. The name of Jesus Christ has strengthened this man. So we have the physical salvation of this man. And the same thing is true when we read through this passage in chapter 4. It's the name of Jesus that is prominent. Emmanuel is his name, God with us. And I would trust that we wouldn't get distracted as we often do when we study or when we live our lives and we forget about it's all, the fact that it's all about Jesus and we really do make a mess of it when we emphasize something else. So please, uh, let's fixate on the idea that it is his name. Now, in this uh, wonderful passage, we have the persecution problem. This is where we begin to see the persecution of the saints uh, who 
were um, uh, part of the, the, the initial church in Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost when the church was actually formed. There are some questions I want to ask you as we begin, and as I ask you these questions, uh, it also serves as uh, some of the application that we want to draw from this passage. So the first question that should come to mind is, well, how are his disciples like him? How are his disciples, the disciples of Jesus, pictured in the book of Acts, like Jesus? We're going to see this theme throughout. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, remember, and it's entitled the Acts of the Apostles because it's what they are going to continue doing, many of things of the things in the same power and authority and dynamic, miraculous working uh, power that Jesus himself did. And so we're going to see today, how are they like him? And furthermore, how can we be like him in this regard? Another question that might come to our minds is, well, have we ever tasted bitter opposition? We're going to read in just a few moments about the bitterest opposition that you could face. And maybe a good question for us is, have we ever faced such opposition because of our faith? Uh, if not, James would suggest that it may be because we're not living lives as holy as we might or as separated as we might, because those who live for Jesus will suffer for him, James says. Another question might be is, well, what about religious leadership? Does relig religious leadership welcome the gospel of the name of Jesus? And I'll be commenting on that in particular. I'll also be quoting from J. Vernon McGee, our crusty old commentator, a love, wonderful man, who had something very specific to say about this very issue. Perhaps another question that we could ask concerning our witness is, what evidence precedes our witness? Now, it's been a long time since I healed anybody. <laughs> In fact, I never have. And, uh, but it looks like God healed a man through Peter and John at that beautiful gate, remember? And uh, there was evidence of the miraculous working of God that preceded the verbal testimony. Now, that's a principle that we need to keep in mind. Not that we're going to be doing miracles. Not that I'm going to be uh, used by God to, to heal someone. Uh, those gifts may be operative today. They may not be. But it's certainly under God's will and His sovereignty uh, if anything happens along those lines. But there needs to be evidence prior to our witness. And in chapter 4, there has been tremendous evidence that God is at work in their lives. Another question could be asked, and that is, what persecution prevents our witness? In other words, what keeps our mouths shut? What takes away our confidence and our boldness? What keeps us from speaking the whole truth when we have an opportunity to speak it? Think along those lines as well. And I think another question might have to do with our commitment level. You see these men, these first believers, these uh, followers of Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, uh, these uh, individuals were willing to be imprisoned for the sake of the name. And uh, the question should be asked by each of us. If push came to shove, if our, we were backed into a corner and it was your job or your faith, or worse yet, your life or your faith in Jesus, what would we say? What would we do? Would we, we be willing to submit that to God's sovereign control? Well, in chapters 4 through 7 of this text, there is a series of similar confrontations with each one building up to a crisis in Stephen's death in chapter 6 and the persecution that followed it. But there is ongoing persecution as it mounts in the first few chapters of the book of Acts. The first four verses of chapter 4 conclude the incident that we've already studied, the healing of the man at the beautiful gate. So let's read them together in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. It says, as they were speaking to the people, the they is probably a reference to Peter and John. They were the ones involved in the healing miracle. They were speaking to the people, and now all of a sudden the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed, and that's putting it mildly. The Greek is extremely strong here. They were fit, well, they were just in bad shape. They greatly disturbed because of what they were teaching the people and because they were proclaiming in Jesus 
the resurrection from the dead. And so they laid hands on them. They put them in jail until the next day because it was already evening, and of course, Jewish law forbade them from conducting court in the evening. Now, that didn't matter with Jesus, but I guess they're a little afraid that they're going to upset more people in this time. Oh, please don't miss the point. This is the same group of leaders, the same names, Caiaphas and Annas. It's the same group of people who brought about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so it's the same group now dealing with the followers of the resurrected one. They thought they had done enough by putting to bed this Messiah talk. Verse 4 says, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's verses 1 through 4. And I want to take you through uh, just a couple of things here. First of all, I want you to notice that there is opposition to the name. And what we're seeing in this whole passage is what I would call ineffective re restraint. It's impossible to restrain the witness. And um, uh, maybe it has been possible to restrain some of our witness, and we should be chastened because of that, because the witness should never be restrained. Now, what do we find first of all? Well, there is an opposition against these men. And the opposition comes in several forms. It's first of all a reference to those who are uh, the priests and then the captain of the temple. The captain of the temple is the one called in Hebrew the Sagan. And he was the one, and according to the Talmud, who was second to the high priest. So we have the very top echelon of the Jewish leaders once again in uh, opposition to those who are preaching the name. And, and so, so we have the, the priests whom you know and the captain of the temple whom you know, the Sadducees, the larger group coming up to them, and very, they're very greatly disturbed. I want you to skip down to verse 5 because it tells us that on the next day we have some others individual, other individuals, the rulers and the elders and the scribes are gathered together. And then he mentions in verse 6, Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and then John and Alexander, possibly sons of Caiaphas, we're not sure, and all who were of high priestly descent. Well, what is he talking about when he speaks of this opposition? The Sadducees were Levitical priests who claimed to represent ancient orthodoxy. They opposed any development in biblical law, and they denied the doctrine of the bodily resurrection. And so they disagreed with Peter's preaching on resurrection. Remember, I told you before that every chapter of the book of Acts mentions the resurrection. But they believed that the Messianic age had already begun as well. They felt that the Maccabean period, when the Maccabeans took over the temple and uh, then they reestablished their worship, and the Sadducees became the leaders of that. They felt that they were in the Messianic age, and their Sadducean supervision was going to bring about an eventual overthrow of Rome, although they were in league with Rome because they didn't want to cause any uh, uh, ripples at this point. Uh, who were they then? Well, they're the priests, they're the elders who are the family leaders, they are the scribes, which were the Pharisees, the minority group within the Sanhedrin. They are the ones who had just become extremely wealthy through greed and through the way that they were handling the sacrificial system. You may recall that even in the time of Jesus, he cleansed the temple. And why did he cleanse the temple? It was because of this group of extremely wealthy leaders in Israel who were controlling the entire system. I want to read to you from John Olgavy a description of Annas and the what is called the Annas Bazaar, not B-I, but B-A. Listen to this. He says, Annas was the infamous power behind the ecclesiastical throne in Jerusalem. He had been a high priest from A.D. 6 through 14. Five of his sons, through nepotism, and now Caiaphas, his son-in-law, had followed him in the powerful office. Before the Roman occupation, a high priest had, to held, had held office for life, but by the time an appointment was made each year, by this time an appointment was made each year by the Roman govern, governor, it went to the highest bidder, so you could pay for the privilege of being the high priest. And the one who was willing to be collusive collaborator with Rome, this man Annas, had used his immense wealth to assure the continuance of his dynasty. And the plot thickens, as we discover, 
as to how he amassed his fortune, and it was through the bazaars of Annas, as they were called. In the court of the Gentiles of the temple, they sold sacrificial animals at extortionist prices, and only these animals were accepted by the inspectors who were appointed by Annas or the members of his family in office. Tragic exploitation resulted, and Annas's fortune grew. But the common people hated the high priestly family, but they couldn't do anything about it. It would not have taken much to ignite an insurrection. Jesus was growing in his popularity, and he had to be checked, of course. His preaching and his miracles culminating in the right raising of Lazarus from the dead had instigated the plot of Annas and Caiaphas against him. So remember, we had the leadership of the Jewish community acting out against Jesus, trying to, to squelch the message. And it was the cleansing of the temple of the profitable money-changing and bazaars that sealed his death. Uncalculable time and energy had been expended by the high priest to assure the crucifixion. And imagine the fiendish delight of the arch manipulators on the Sabbath day after Calvary. Finally, Jesus is sealed in the tomb forever. News of the resurrection had reached them, which they squelched with rumors that someone had stolen the body of Jesus. So they were finished with him forever, or so they thought. And now we have those following, and they're speaking the truth about Jesus. So who is the opposition? It's religious, it's political, it is philosophical. The Sadducees rejected the resurrection. They thought they were living in the, mess the Messianic age at the time. They were jealous because of the teaching that was going on. You see, that's a big difference in the religious leadership and the religious elite. They don't care about teaching. They're all about good works. And that's what the hypocrites of that day were saying. They were saying, you can inherit the kingdom of God if you would just do as we do. And Jesus says, no. No one can inherit the kingdom of God. There has to be a, a kind of righteousness that is superior to that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so, the preaching goes on. Now, you might ask, what is the connection when we think about today and what it is like? I've often been asked why I don't go to the ministerium meetings of most of the churches in our area. Maybe I should, maybe I should try to make a difference, but every time I have, I've been sorely disappointed with the attitude of religious leaders, even in our own community. And um, I'll tell you why. It's because the emphasis is always on externals. It's always upon cleaning up those who are around, doing something to make things better for people, rather than preaching the name, the name of Jesus Christ. And that's where I wanted to quote uh, uh, Dr. McGee. He said, a woman called me one time and asked me to serve on a committee that was trying to clean up downtown Los Angeles. I agreed it needed to be cleaned up, but I told her I couldn't serve on that committee. She said, you, aren't you a minister? Aren't you interested in cleaning up Los Angeles? And he answered, I will not serve on your committee because I don't think you're going about it in the right way. Then I told her what my friend told me some years ago. He said, we're called to fish in the fish pond, not to clean up the fish pond. This old world is a place to fish. And Jesus said he would make us fishers of men, and the world is the place to fish. We're not called upon to clean up the fish pond. We need to catch the fish and then clean them. <laughs> And then he says this, and I want you to listen very carefully because it's part of our philosophy of ministry here. If you like it, great. If you don't, oh, uh, maybe you need another church. He said this, I have found that the biggest enemies of the preaching of the gospel are not the liquor folk. The gangsters have never bothered me. I can just hear McGee saying this. Do you know where I've had my trouble as a preacher? It's with the so-called religious leaders, the liberals, those who claim to be born again. They actually became enemies of the preaching of the gospel, and it was amazing to me to find out how many of them wanted to destroy my ministry. I think there are those who want to destroy the preaching of the gospel today, and they are religious people in high places, and I don't think we can succumb to that kind of pressure. Now, let's go on and notice that uh, what happened to these men? Well, they were actually arrested 
for the name. So there is opposition to the name, and then there is an arrest for the name. And if we were arrested for being Christians, would there be enough evidence to convict? Remember that old saying. Well, verse 5 says, on the next day their rulers and the elder, oh, I'm sorry, back up a little bit because it says they laid hands on them in verse 3, put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. Um, this is, uh, laying hands is a mild English translation of the word that means seizing violently. There's no disproof of the resurrection in this incident, and there's no evidence to say that they had committed a crime, but they are guilty until proven innocent. So they have taken them and they've thrown them in the clink overnight. Clearly, we see a principle in the book of Acts, and it is this, that kind of persecution, that kind of treatment unjustly results in the growth of the church. We ought to pray for more persecution, probably. And look at what happened in verse 4. Many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to 5,000. Notice that no baptism is mentioned here, but it does say that 5,000 believed. Persecution produces growth. One man has suggested that just as the 5,000 that Jesus fed received the physical bread of life, so too, in the first century, Allah, their Savior, the disciples were used to bring 5,000 people to eat the bread of life. I like that thought. It presents this same kind of idea. Now, it goes on to say that on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and I, I read this about who was involved. Verse 7 says, when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Well, the opponents are standing, taking a stance against Jesus because they're taking a stance against His disciples. Even though a large number has responded to the message. Now, some have asked what was the population of Jerusalem at this time, and you know we, we really don't know. The estimates go from 25,000 to 250,000. But in any case, you have a group of 5,000 who actually were Jewish who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. I think that the estimate is probably better around 100,000. But that's not a very good idea because Josephus tells us that over 100,000 Jews were killed during the invasion of Titus. So it could be that there were as many as 200,000 Jews, but there was an onslaught under Titus that killed perhaps half the population. Who knows for sure? Look at what it says. When they place them in the center, they say, what name have you done this? And verse 8 says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that it's by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this this man stands here before you in good health. So we have the opposition to the name, and we have the arrest for the name, and now we have the preaching of the name. When we have the preaching of the name before the Sanhedrin, what we're actually seeing is a great deal of courage. When he preaches in the name, and he is willing to take the flack that comes with it. There's no doubt but what he remembers the words of his Savior. And when we are faced with difficult positions in which we are preaching the name and we want to say everything we can, we should remember what Jesus said to his disciples. I want you to look at it. It's in Luke 21. If you just turn back to Luke 21 for a moment, you may recall what Jesus had to say beginning at verse 12. Jesus was saying that before the end of the age comes, here's what's going to happen. Before all of these things, they will lay their hands upon you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and the prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. Isn't it interesting? 
the name is always prominent. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. Oh, I didn't know that's what the persecution was supposed to do. No, he says it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds now not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. I'll go, I'll give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. Now, he didn't by any means suggest here that we shouldn't be prepared to give a reason for the answer that is, or for the hope that is within us. So the theology class on Tuesday nights is important. Y'all come. We are supposed to study. We're also, we are supposed to know the word as best we can. But what Jesus was, was telling Peter and John and the others was that when you are pulled before the magistrates, you're going to be given supernatural enablement to defend your faith. Could I suggest to you that that's what we have available to us? And yet very often we do whatever we can to avoid such situations that would put us in that kind of, under that kind of pressure. Verse 8 of our passage says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, rulers, elders of the people, filled with the Holy Spirit. What do you think that means? Well, it means control. It always does. It means that there was a filling or a controlling of Peter by the Spirit of God, which enabled him to do what he otherwise would not have been able to do. This particular filling in the book of Acts is the filling that is used for a particular occasion, for an enablement, just like the Spirit of God came upon many of the judges and the kings of the Old Testament. It was for a particular job. It's not the same as the filling of the Spirit, which is the continuous power for living. But they're so closely connected. Could I suggest to you that one of the reasons we do not have the kind of success that we'd love to have as believers is because we often do not recognize that there is a power working through us that can control us to do things that we otherwise would not be able to do. It doesn't matter whether it's speaking before a group of people with boldness or whether it is living a life that is contrary to our natural inclinations. It is the truth that the Spirit enables, the Spirit empowers. And I would wish for all of us that we would have more of the evidence that shows that this is what has happened. Well, Peter goes on to say in verse 9, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, the word made well is sosthenai. It's from another word which means salvation. What Peter is doing, or Luke as he records this message, is to say that that man was healed physically. He was made well. But the very same word is used a little bit later in verse 12 when it says there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. It's the word saved. So as I've said before, the physical miracles that have been found in the book of Acts are to picture the spiritual miracle of salvation. It is true that there is physical miracle of healing going on now because God is capable of doing that. But these miracles point out the spiritual salvation, the spiritual wellness. We've been made well because of faith in the name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the preaching of the name is very evident here, isn't it? Peter had such power, such courage. Let it be known to all of you. And to all of the people of Israel, he says, notice that he's preaching to the crowd. What kind of a crowd was this? Diametrically opposed to the message that he's preaching. I don't know. He calls it a trial, doesn't he? He says there's a trial that's been going on here a little bit later in the context. This trial, it kind of reminds me of, regardless of your political persuasion, if you've been watching Samuel Alito being interrogated by his enemies. It's like there's a ferocity, a viciousness on the part of those who are opposed to him. It's illogical to me, much, much of it was. It's irrational, but it's vehement. It's a vitriolic attack of a person. We don't have much given to us here, but I think that it went on and on in the interrogation phase as these men are attacking Peter and John. Verse 11 says, he is the stone, this Jesus is, 
which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. I think he's talking about the very fact that Jesus is either the chief cornerstone of the building on the foundation, or he is the capstone. It's hard to tell from the verse. But he's talking about this church that is going to be built on the name of Jesus. And then verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Well, that's verses 1 through 12. And um, verses 13 through 22 give the response. And I just want to read through the response, and then we'll take it up here next week. And we'll end with the prayer meeting that goes on in the uh, back at home in verses 23 and through the end of the chapter. But let's read verses 13 through 22, and I'll point out just a few things to you. What is the response? What is the response of the ones who are interrogating? They want to prohibit the preaching of the name. So there's opposition, there's imprisonment, there's the preaching of the name regardless, and then there's the desire to squelch it. Verse 13 says, now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed. They began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another. They had this little committee meeting. And they said, what are we going to do with these men? The fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and, and we can't deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let's warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You see, it's going to be ineffective restraint. Because verse 19 says, Peter and John said to them, well, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. But here's the deal. Well, they didn't say that, but they said in verse 20, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Does that characterize us? Or did we stop speaking about it a long time ago? We cannot stop speaking. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them, and on account of all the people that because they were all glorifying God for what had happened, I mean, they had this uh, swell, it, it, it's swelling up of the people in support of these two. Why? Verse 22, it was a miracle. The man that was healed was more than 40 years old. And so they knew it. Well, the response then of this Sanhedrin was astonishment. They couldn't do anything about the evidence. They had their little committee meeting, but they couldn't overcome the boldness that these men had. Now, the word in verse 13 where it says confidence is the word parousia. It's made up of two Greek words, pan and racia, which means to say everything. Isn't that interesting? They spoke everything. They had the courage to do it. William Barclay says this about the incident and the courage that Peter had. He says, when we read the speech of Peter, we must remember to whom it was spoken. And when we do, remember that it becomes one of the world's greatest demonstrations of courage. It was spoken to an audience of the wealthiest, most intellectual, and the most powerful in the land. And yet Peter, the Galilean fisherman, stands before them rather as their judge than as their victim. Kind of turn the tables there. But further, this was the very court which had condemned Jesus to death, and Peter knew it. And he knew that at this moment he was taking his own life in his hands. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we had that kind of holy boldness? Christians in the classrooms, don't take the liberal guff. Stand up. Say, I, I can't go along with that because there's evidence to prove otherwise. Christians in the courtrooms, taking a stand for what is right, for what is biblical, 
refusing to accept the trend of society that is denying family, as it is described in the scriptures. Christians in the workplace taking a stand against the greed and the corruption of the business that you may be in, being willing to lose your job. Reminds me of the medical students that I work with in the medical school at Cornell University Medical School. They were being forced to view pornography uh, in sex education. And a couple of students came to me and they said, uh, I was working with the Christian Medical and Dental Society at the time, they said, Greg, we, we really, uh, boy, we're having trouble. We just don't want to do this. And I said, well, how much is it uh, worth to you not to do it? They said, well, you know, if we, if we tell our, our professors that we're not going to sit through this because it's beneath our moral position and our Christian position, we could get kicked out of the program. It was very possible. And I simply said to them, you've got to obey God rather than men. You cannot stop talking about your faith. When you do, when you do, you're denying the Lord that bought you. Well, the good news is that they stopped, or they, uh, they, they didn't go. They stood up. And believe it or not, God honored their decision in integrity and allowed them to continue through the program, unscathed by that kind of stuff. So where is our holy boldness today? Do you have any boldness in the classroom, in the courtroom, in the workplace, in education, in the PTA, wherever? Well, let me go on and ask a few questions before we conclude. Um, I don't know where we are. In, yeah. Boldness comes from assurance of truth, assurance of the resurrection. You have that kind of faith to believe that he really was raised from the dead? Boldness increases with personal contact. Doesn't it say they recognize them as having been with Jesus? Now, obviously, that's a reference to the fact that they were his traveling companions. But may I suggest to you that simply spending time with Jesus increases our boldness. Boldness rejects other authority. He is the authority of our lives. He is the Lord. Boldness produces the conviction by the Spirit. So the filling of the Holy Spirit and the fulfilling of the Holy Scriptures and the time spent with Jesus, who is the only Savior. May I suggest to you as well that in verse 12, if we don't have a grip on the exclusivity of our faith, then we're not going to be bold about it. If he's only one out of a dozen different ways to get saved, then boldness is gone. It's out the window. But if you really do believe what the scriptures indicate, what Jesus himself said, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, then you're going to share your faith with the Buddhist and the Hindu. You're going to spend a lot of time with the secular humanist or with the Jew. And you're going to say that there is one name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And so the exclusivity is important. Boldness produces conviction by the Spirit. Boldness results in persuasion of others. 5,000 people came to faith. Boldness counters fear. I wonder, what keeps us from courageously proclaiming the gospel? It's usually one word in various forms. It's a fear, a fear of rejection by others, a fear of failure, a fear of the loss of uh, position or status, it always happens. But boldness counters fear. Boldness encourages the believers, and that's what we shall see next week, at how encouraged these believers are because of the faith of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. Does it end the persecution? I wish it had, but it certainly does not. The persecution goes on. A couple of questions as we conclude then. So what? These are the so what questions. Does this mean anything to me or you? I think we can ask uh, four questions very simply. Number one, what is our message? 
is our message that we have a, a real nice church here. We keep it warm during the cold weather and cool during the hot weather. We have beautiful green pews we can sit in. We sing a lot and we are very friendly. Is that your message? If that's our message, we don't deserve to see any growth. Our message has got to be that we trust in the resurrected Lord who died for a purpose and the purpose was to do what we can't do. And that is to give us a clean bill of health. It is to give us a standing in the presence of God who cannot look upon sin because Christ died as our substitute. And hallelujah, he's raised from the dead. Secondly, what is our motive? Is your motive to get more people to come to your social club? That's a horrible motive in the church. I realize we need to get more people in, we need to be user-friendly and all of that, but if that's our motive, then we, we've really got a problem. Our motive needs to be the same as Jesus Christ. He loved the world. God loved the world, and that's why he sent his son, so that not, you wouldn't have to perish, but you'd have everlasting life. And then what is our method? How do we go about it? Do we drag people in here on a Sunday morning so they can hear the gospel preached at them? No, it's just like Keith said earlier, we are built for relationships. And I'm all, I, I think I'm always amazed when I ask the question, what non-Christians have you developed a friendship with? Who are you working with to try to bring them into relationship with Jesus Christ? That's a big question. And most of us have a very short list of non-Christians that we spend time with. That's the method, relational. And then, of course, we're, we need to speak the truth in love. And the final question is, what is our miracle? Well, it may not be the healing of a lame man in front of the beautiful gate, but it should be an understanding that we have been saved through the beautiful name, the name of Jesus Christ. That's the miracle. It transforms a selfish bigot into someone who is generous and open and tolerant of others. It transforms a, 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 an abusive father and parent into someone who is truly gentle and understanding. It transforms the skeptic into the believer because of a miracle that takes place. Ogilvy tells the story, and I'll close with this, about a medical doctor who was a scoffer sitting in his congregation for years, very well-known medical doctor who had written textbooks on uh, surgery. He's sitting there with his arms folded most of the time. He calls him his Easter doctor now because on one Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday, when Ogilvy was speaking, the man turns to his wife and he says simply, I think this is true. <laughs> I think this is true. And then a couple of weeks later, he had his miracle, which really was the salvation of his soul. And then it continued after that. There was a medical missionary trip that he funded completely because he had substantial wealth. And it so happened that almost to the dollar, he received a royalty check in the mail after he had committed all of that money to send a whole group of people to Japan for a long time to, min to minister. He got a royalty check for the sale of one of his textbooks for almost exactly the same amount of money. So uh, he said, I think God might be alive. He might be real. So what miracle has preceded your message? It should at least be the miracle of a salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. And it also uh, should be a miracle of seeing some answered prayer in your life where you've stepped out in faith, he's answered, he's supplied a need, and then you can testify that God is real, he is alive in your life, he's doing something for you. And then, by God's grace, you'll be able to share the truth with others, and the, the truth of the beautiful name. By the way, when he received the royalty check, he gave that away too. <laughs> Stand with me, let's close in prayer. Father, we have sung songs today of how wonderful you are, how great is your name, how tremendous it is to know that uh, just spending time with you is better than a, a 
thousand days, a thousand years elsewhere. And so we are grateful that you called us into relationship with you. We are grateful that we have a message to give. We're grateful for the miracle of our own salvation and for the way you've supplied our every need from that point on. May we be faithful. That's all, faithful. May we be willing to be bold. May we speak all that we need to say. May we have confidence, meaning with faith, approach this life that you've given us to live. And may we be, most of all, effective, because there's no restraint upon our message. It is ineffective restraint. We cannot stop speaking about our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.